monster was away to get back homeward. Casper McCann, the well-known shrill voice, startled Al Mayer from his dream of splendid future into the unpleasant realities of the present hour. An unpleasant voice, too. He had heard it for many years, and with every year he liked it less. No matter, there would be an end to all this soon. He shuffled uneasily, but took no further notice of the call. Leaning with both his elbows on the balustrade of the veranda, he went on looking fixedly at the great river that flowed, indifferent and hurried, before his eyes. He liked to look at it about the time of sunset, perhaps because at that time the sinking sun would spread a glowing gold tinge on the waters of the Pante, and Al Mayer's thoughts were often busy with gold, Gold he had failed to secure, gold the others had secured, dishonestly, of course, or gold he might yet secure. Through his own honest exertions, for himself and Nina, he absorbed himself in his dream of wealth and power away from this coast where he had dwelt for so many years, forgetting the bitterness of toil and strife and the vision of a great and splendid reward. They would live in Europe, he and his daughter. They would be rich and respected. Nobody would think of her mixed blood in the presence of her great beauty and of his immense wealth. Witnessing her triumphs, he would grow young again. He would forget the twenty-five years of heartbreaking struggle on this coast, where he felt like a prisoner. All this was nearly within his reach. Let only Dane return and return soon he must, in his own interest, for his own share. He was now more than a week late. Perhaps he would return tonight. Such were Al Mayer's thoughts as, standing on the veranda of his new but already decaying house, that last failure of his life, he looked on the broad river. There was no tinge of gold on it this evening, for it had been swollen by the rains, and rolled an angry and muddy flood under his inattentive eyes, carrying small driftwood and big dead logs, and whole uprooted trees with branches and foliage, amongst which the water swirled and roared angrily. One of those drifting trees grounded on the shelving shore, just by the house, and Al Mayer, neglecting his dream, watched it with languid interest. The tree swung slowly round, amid the hiss and foam of the water, and soon, getting free of the obstruction, began to move downstream again, rolling slowly over, raising upwards a long, denuded branch, like a hand lifted in mute appeal to heaven against the river's brutal and unnecessary violence. Almayer's interest in the fate of that tree increased rapidly. He leaned over to see if it would clear the low point below. It did. Then he drew back, thinking that now its course was free down to the sea, and he envied the lot of that inanimate thing now growing small and indistinct in the deepening darkness. As he lost sight of it altogether, he began to wonder how far out to sea it would drift. Would the current carry it north or south? south, probably, till it drifted inside of the Silavis, as far as the Mascar, perhaps. Mascar, Almayer's quickened fancy distanced the tree on its imaginary voyage, but his memory lagging behind some twenty years or more in point of time saw a young and slim Almayer, clad all in white and modest-looking, landing from the Dutch mailboat on the dusty jetty of Mascar coming to woo fortune in the go-downs of old Huddig. It was an important epoch in his life, the beginning of a new existence for him. His father, a subordinate official employed in the botanical gardens of Boitenzorg, 
was no doubt delighted to place his son in such a firm. The young man himself, too, was nothing loath to leave the poisonous shores of Java and the meager comforts of his parental bungalow, where the father grumbled all day at the stupidity of native gardeners and the mother, from the depths of her long easy chair, bewailed the lost glories of Amsterdam, where she had been brought up, and of her position as the daughter of a cigar dealer there. Almayer had left his home with a light heart and a lighter pocket, speaking English well and strong in arithmetic, ready to conquer the world, never doubting that he would. After those twenty years, standing in the close and stifling heat of a Bornean evening, he recalled with pleasurable regret the image of Huddock's lofty and cool warehouse, with their long and straight avenues of gin cases and bales of Manchester goods, the big door swinging noiselessly, the dim light of the place, so delightful after the glare of the streets, the little railed-off spaces amongst piles of merchandise, where the Chinese clerks, neat, cool, and sad-eyed, wrote rapidly and in silence amidst the din of the working gangs rolling casks or shifting cases to a muttered song, ending with a desperate yell. At the upper end, facing the great door, there was a larger space, railed off, well lighted. There, the noise was subdued by distance, and above it rose the soft and continuous clank of silver guilders, which other discreet Chinamen were counting and piling up under the supervision of Mr. Vink, the cashier, the genius presiding in the place, the right hand of the master. In that clear space, Almayer worked at his table, not far from a little green painted door, by which always stood a Malay, in a red sash and turban, and whose hand, holding a small string dangling from above, moved up and down with the regularity of a machine. The string worked a punka on the other side of the green door, where the so-called private office was, and where old Huddick, the master, sat enthroned, holding noisy receptions. Sometimes the little door would fly open, disclosing to the outer world, through the bluish haze of tobacco smoke, a long table, loaded with bottles of various shapes and tall water pitchers, rattan easy chairs, occupied by noisy men in sprawling attitudes, while the master would put his head through and, holding by the handle, would grunt confidentially to Vink, perhaps send an order thundering down the warehouse, or spy a hesitating stranger and greet him with a friendly roar. Welcome, Capitan. Where you gome from? Bali, eh? Got bonies? I want the bonies. Want all you got. Ha, 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 ha. Come in. Then the stranger was dragged in, in a tempest of yells, the door was shut, and the usual noises refilled the place. The song of the workmen, the rumble of barrels, the scratch of rapid pens, while above all rose the musical chink of broad silver pieces streaming ceaselessly through the yellow fingers of the attentive Chinaman. At that time, Makassar was teeming with life and commerce. It was the point in the islands where tended all those bold spirits who, fitting out schooners on the Australian coast, invaded the Malay archipelago in search of money and adventure. Bold, reckless, keen in business, not disinclined for a brush with the pirates that were to be found on many a coast as yet, making money fast, they used to have a general rendezvous in the bay for purposes of trade and dissipation. The Dutch merchants called those men English peddlers. Some of them were undoubtedly gentlemen for whom that kind of life had a charm. Most were seamen. The acknowledged king of them all was Tom Lingard, he whom the Malays, honest or dishonest, 
quiet fishermen or desperate cutthroats recognized as the Raja Laut, the Raja Laut, the king of the sea. El Mayer had heard of him before he had been three days in Makassar, had heard the stories of his smart business transactions, his loves, and also of his desperate fights with the Sulu pirates, together with the romantic tale of some child, a girl, found in a piratical prow by the victorious Lingard. When, after a long contest, he boarded the craft, driving the crew overboard, this girl, it was generally known, Lingard had adopted, was having her educated in some convent in Java, and spoke of her as my daughter. He had sworn a mighty oath to marry her to a white man before he went home and to leave her all his money. And Captain Lingard has lots of money, would say Mr. Vink solemnly, with his head on one side, lots of money, more than Huddig, and after a pause, just to let his hearers recover from their astonishment at such an incredible assertion, he would add in an explanatory whisper, you know, he has discovered a river. That was it. He had discovered a river. That was the fact placing old Lingard so much above the common crowd of seagoing adventurers who traded with Huddig in the daytime and drank champagne, gambled, sang noisy songs, and made love to half-caste girls under the broad veranda of the Sunda Hotel at night. Into that river, whose entrances himself only knew, Lingard used to take his assorted cargo of Manchester goods, brass gongs, rifles, and gunpowder. His brig flash, which he commanded himself, would on those occasions disappear quietly during the night from the roadstead while his companions were sleeping off the effects of the midnight carouse. Lingard, seeing them drunk under the table before going on board, himself unaffected by any amount of liquor, many tried to follow him and find that land of plenty for a guta perka and rattans, pearl shells and bird's nests, wax, and gum demar, but the little flash could outsail every craft in those seas. A few of them came to grief on hidden sandbanks and coral reefs, losing their all and barely escaping with life from the cool grip of the sunny and smiling sea. Others got discouraged, and for many years the green and peaceful looking islands guarding the entrances to the promised land kept their secret with all the merciless serenity of tropical nature. And so Lingard came and went on his secret or open expeditions, becoming a hero in Al Mayer's eyes by the boldness and enormous profits of his ventures. Seeming to Al Mayer a very great man indeed as he saw him marching up the warehouse, grunting a how are you to Vink or greeting Huddig the master, with a boisterous, Hello, old pirate, alive yet? As a preliminary to transacting business behind the little green door. Often of an evening and the silence of the then deserted warehouse, Al Mayer, putting away his papers before driving home with Mr. Vink, in whose household he lived, would pause, listening to the noise of a hot discussion in the private office, would hear the deep and monotonous growl of the master and the roared out interpretations of Lingard, two mastiffs fighting over a marrowy bone. But to Al Mayer's ears, it sounded like a quarrel of titans, a battle of the gods. After a year or so, Lingard, having been brought often in contact with Al Mayer in the course of business, took a sudden and, to the onlookers, a rather inexplicable fancy to the young man. He sang his praises late at night over a convivial glass to his cronies in the Sunda Hotel, and one fine morning electrified Vink by declaring that he must have that young fellow for a supercargo. Kind of captain's clerk. Do all my quilling for me, Huddick consented. Al Mayer, with youth's natural craving for change, 
was nothing loth, and packing his few belongings, started in the flash on one of those long cruises when the old seaman was wont to visit almost every island in the archipelago. Months slipped by, and Lingard's friendship seemed to increase, often pacing the deck with Almayer when the faint night breeze, heavy with aromatic exhalations of the islands, shoved the brig gently along under the peaceful and sparkling sky. Did the old seaman open his heart to his entranced listener? He spoke of his past life, of escaped dangers, of big profits in his trade, of new combinations that were in the future to bring profits bigger still. Often he had mentioned his daughter, the girl found in the pirate prowl, speaking of her with a strange assumption of fatherly tenderness. She must be a big girl now, he used to say. It's nigh unto four years since I have seen her. Dammy, Almayer, if I don't think we will run into Surabaya this trip. And after such a declaration, he always dived into his cabin muttering to himself, something must be done, must be done. More than once, he would astonish Almayer by walking up to him rapidly, clearing his throat with a powerful hem, <clears throat> as if he was going to say something, and then turning abruptly away to lean over the bulwarks in silence, and watch, motionless, for hours, the gleam and sparkle of the phosphorescent sea along the ship's side. It was the night before arriving in Surabaya when one of those attempts at confidential communication succeeded. After clearing his throat, he spoke. He spoke to some purpose. He wanted Almayer to marry his adopted daughter. And don't you kick because you're white, he shouted, suddenly not giving the surprised young man the time to say a word. None of that with me. Nobody will see the color of your wife's skin. The dollars are too thick for that, I tell you. And mind you, they will be thicker yet before I die. There will be millions, Caspar, millions, I say, and all for her and for you if you do what you are told. Startled by the unexpected proposal, Almayer hesitated and remained silent for a minute. He was gifted with a strong and active imagination, and in that short space of time he saw, as in a flash of dazzling light, great piles of shining gilders, and realized all the possibilities of an opulent existence. The consideration, the indolent ease of life, for which he felt himself so well fitted, his ships, his warehouses, his merchandise, old Lingard would not live forever, and, crowning all, the big mansion in Amsterdam, that earthly paradise of his dreams, where, made king amongst men by old Lingard's money, he would pass the evening of his days in inexpressible splendor. As to the other side of the picture, the companionship for life of a Malay girl, that legacy of a boat full of pirates, there was only within him a confused consciousness of shame that he, a white man, still a convent education of four years, and then she may mercifully die. He was always lucky, and money is powerful. Go through it. Why not? He had a vague idea of shutting her up somewhere, anywhere, out of his gorgeous future. Easy enough to dispose of a Malay woman, a slave, after all, to his eastern mind. Convent or no convent, ceremony or no ceremony. He lifted his head and confronted the anxious yet irate seaman. I, of course, anything you wish, Captain Lingard. Call me father, my boy. She does, said the mollified old adventurer. Dammy, though, if I didn't think you were going to refuse. Mind you, Caspar, I always get my way, so it would have been no use, but you are no fool. He remembered well that time. The look, the accent, the words, the effect they produced on him, his very surroundings. He remembered the narrow, slanting deck of the brig, the silent, sleeping coast, the smooth, black surface of the sea, with a great bar of gold laid on it by the rising moon. He remembered it all, 
and he remembered his feelings of mad exultation at the thought of that fortune thrown into his hands. He was no fool then, and he was no fool now. Circumstances had been against him. The fortune was gone, but hope remained. Almayer descended the ladder carefully. He shivered in the night air, and suddenly became aware of the intense darkness, which, on the sun's departure, had closed in upon the river, blotting out the outlines of the opposite shore. Only the fire of dry branches lit outside the stockade of the Rajah's compound called fitfully into view the ragged trunks of the surrounding trees, putting a stain of glowing red halfway across the river where the drifting logs were hurrying towards the sea through the impenetrable gloom. He had a hazy recollection of having been called some time during the evening by his wife, to his dinner probably, but a man busy contemplating the wreckage of his past and the dawn of new hopes cannot be hungry whenever his rice is ready. Time he went home, though. It was getting late. He stepped cautiously on the loose planks towards the ladder. A lizard, disturbed by the noise, emitted a plaintive note and scurried through the long grass growing on the bank. Almayer descended the ladder carefully, now thoroughly recalled to the realities of life, by the care necessary to prevent a fall on the uneven ground where the stones, decaying planks, and half-sawn beams were piled up in inextricable confusion. As he turned towards the house where he lived, my old house, he called it, his ear detected the splash of paddles away in the darkness of the river. He stood still in the path, attentive, and surprised at anybody being on the river at this late hour during such a heavy freshet. Now he could hear the paddles distinctly, and even a rapidly exchanged word in low tones, the heavy breathing of men fighting with the current and hugging the bank on which he stood, quite close too, but it was too dark to distinguish anything under the overhanging bushes. Arabs, no doubt, muttered Almayer to himself, peering into the solid blackness. What are they up to now? Some of Abdullah's business, curse him. The boat was very close now. Oh, yeah, man, hailed our mayor. The sound of voices ceased, but the paddles worked as furiously as before. Then the bush in front of our mayor shook, and the sharp sound of the paddles falling into the canoe rang in the quiet night. They were holding on to the bush now. But Almayer could hardly make out an indistinct dark shape of a man's head and shoulders above the bank. You, Abdullah? said Almayer doubtfully. A grave voice answered, Tuan Almayer is speaking to a friend. There is no Arab here. Almayer's heart gave a great leap. Dane! he exclaimed. At last! At last! I have been waiting for you every day and every night. I had nearly given you up. Nothing could have stopped me from coming back here, said the other, almost violently. Not even death, he whispered to himself. This is a friend's talk, and is very good, said Almayer heartily. But you are too far here. Drop down to the jetty and let your men cook their rice in my campong while we talk in the house. There was no answer to that invitation. What is it? asked Almayer uneasily. There is nothing wrong with the brig, I hope. The brig is where no orang blanda can lay his hands on her, said Dane, with a gloomy tone in his voice, which Almayer, in his elation, failed to notice. Right, he said, but where are all your men? There are only two with you. Listen, Tuan Almayer, said Dane. Tomorrow's sun shall see me in your house, and then we will talk. Now I must go to the Raja. To the Raja? Why? What do you want with Lakamba? To on tomorrow we talk like friends. I must say Lakamba tonight. Dane, you are not going to abandon me now when all is ready, asked Almayer in a pleading tone. 
have I not returned? But I must see Lakamba first for your good and mine. The shadowy head disappeared abruptly. The bush released from the grasp of the bowman sprang back with a swish, scattering a shower of muddy water over Almayer as he bent forward trying to see. In a little while the canoe shot into the streak of light that streamed on the river from the big fire on the opposite shore, disclosing the outline of two men bending to their work and a third figure in the stern flourishing the steering paddle, his head covered with an enormous round hat like a fantastically exaggerated mushroom. Elmayer watched the canoe till it passed out of the line of light shortly after the murmur of many voices reached him across the water. He could see the torches being snatched out of the burning pile and rendering visible for a moment the gate and the stockade round which they crowded. Then they went in, apparently. The torches disappeared and the scattered fire sent out only a dim and fitful glare. Almayer, stepping homewards, with long strides and mind uneasy, surely Dane was not thinking of playing him false. It was absurd. Dane and Lakamba were both too much interested in the success of his scheme. Trusting to Malays was poor work, but then even Malays have some sense and understand their own interest. All would be well, must be well. At this point in his meditation, he found himself at the foot of the steps leading to the veranda of his home. From the low point of land where he stood, he could see both branches of the river. The main branch of the Pante was lost in complete darkness, for the fire at the Rajas had gone out altogether. But up the Sambir, Reach's eyes could follow the long line of Malay houses crowding the bank with here and there a dim light twinkling through bamboo walls or a smoky torch burning on the platforms built out over the river. Further away, where the island ended in a low cliff, rose a dark mass of buildings towering above the melee structures. Founded solidly on a firm ground with plenty of space, starred by many lights burning strong and white, with a suggestion of paraffin and lamp glasses stood the house of the Godowns of Abdullah bin Selim, the great trader of Sambir. To Almayer the sight was very distasteful, and he shook his fist towards the building that in their evident prosperity looked to him cold and insolent, and contemptuous of his own fallen fortunes. He mounted the steps of his house slowly. In the middle of the veranda there was a round table. On it, a paraffin lamp without a globe shed a hard glare on the three inner sides. The fourth side was open and faced the river. Between the rough supports of the high-pitched roof hung torn rattan screens. There was no ceiling, and the harsh brilliance of the lamp was toned above into a soft half-light that lost itself in the obscurity amongst the rafters. The front wall was cut in two by the doorway of a central passage closed by a red curtain. The woman's room opened into that passage, which led to the back courtyard and to the cooking shed. In one of the side walls there was a doorway, half obliterated words, Office, Lingard and Company, were still legible on the dusty door which looked as if it had been opened for a very long time. Close to the other side wall stood a bent wood rocking chair, and by the table and about the veranda four wooden armchairs straggled forlornly, as if ashamed of their shabby surroundings. A heap of common mats lay in one corner, with an old hammock slung diagonally above. In the other corner, his head wrapped in a piece of red calico, huddled into a shapeless heap, slipped a melee, one of Almayer's domestic slaves. My own people he used to call them. A numerous and representative assembly of moths 
were holding high revels round the lamp to the spirited music of swarming mosquitoes. Under the palm leaf thatch, lizards raced on the beams, calling softly. A monkey, chained to one of the veranda supports, retired for the night under the eaves, peered and grinned at Almayer as it swung to one of the bamboo roof sticks and caused a shower of dust and bits of dried leaves to settle on the shabby table. The floor was uneven, with many withered plants and dried earth scattered about. A general air of squalid neglect pervaded the place. Great red stains on the floor and walls testified to frequent and indiscriminate beetle nut chewing. The light breeze from the river swayed gently the tattered blinds, sending from the woods opposite a faint and sickly perfume as of decaying flowers. Under Almayer's heavy tread, the boards of the veranda creaked loudly. The sleeper in the corner moved uneasily, muttering indistinct words. There was a slight rustle behind the curtain doorway, and a soft voice asked in Malay, Is it you, father? Yes, Nina. I am hungry. Is everybody asleep in this house? Almayer spoke jovially and dropped with a contented sigh into the armchair nearest to the table. Nina Almayer came through the curtained doorway, followed by an old Malay woman who busied herself in setting upon the table a plate full of rice and fish, a jar of water, and a bottle half full of Guinevere. After carefully placing before her master a cracked glass tumbler and a tin spoon, she went away noiselessly. Nina stood by the table, one hand lightly resting on its edge, the other hanging listlessly by her side. Her face turned towards the outer darkness, through which her dreamy eyes seemed to see some entrancing picture, wore a look of impatient expectancy. She was tall for a half-caste, with the correct profile of the father, modified and strengthened by the squareness of the lower part of the face inherited from her maternal ancestors, the Sulu pirates. Her firm mouth, with the lips slightly parted and disclosing a gleam of white teeth, put a vague suggestion of ferocity into the impatient expression of her features, and yet her dark and perfect eyes had all the tender softness of expression common to Malay woman, but with a gleam of superior intelligence. They looked gravely, wide open and steady, as if facing something invisible to all other eyes, while she stood there, all in white, straight, flexible, graceful, unconscious of herself, her low but broad forehead crowned with a shining mass of long black hair that fell in heavy tresses over her shoulders and made her pale olive complexion look paler still by the contrast of its coal black hue. Almayer attacked his rice greedily, but after a few mouthfuls he paused, spoon in hand, and looked at his daughter curiously. Did you hear a boat pass about half an hour ago, Nina? he asked. The girl gave him a quick glance, and moving away from the light, stood with her back to the table. No, she said slowly. There was a boat, at last, Dane himself, and he went on to Lakamba. I know it, for he told me so. I spoke to him, but he would not come here tonight. We'll come tomorrow, he said. He swallowed another spoonful then said, I am almost happy tonight, Nina. I can see the end of a long road, and it leads us away from this miserable swamp. We shall soon get away from here, I and you, my dear little girl. And then he rose from the table and stood looking fixedly before him as if contemplating some enchanting vision. And then he went on, We shall be happy, you and I. Live rich and respected far from here, and forget this life, and all this struggle, and all this misery. He approached his daughter and passed his hand caressingly over her hair. 
It is bad to have to trust a Malay, he said, but I must own that this Dane is a perfect gentleman. A perfect gentleman, he repeated. Did you ask him to come here, father? inquired Nina, not looking at him. Well, of course. We shall start on the day after tomorrow, said Amher joyously. We must not lose any time. Are you glad, little girl? She was nearly as tall as himself, but he liked to recall the time when she was little, and they were all in all to each other. I am glad, she said very low. Of course, said Almeyer vivaciously. You cannot imagine what it is before you. I myself have not been to Europe, but I have heard my mother talk so often that I seem to know all about it. We shall live a, a glorious life. You shall see. Again he stood silent by his daughter's side, looking at that enchanting vision. After a while he shook his clenched hand toward the sleeping settlement. Ah, uh, my friend Abdullah, he cried, we shall see who will have the best of it after all these years. He looked up the river and remarked calmly, another thunderstorm. Well, no thunder will keep me awake tonight, I know. Good night, little girl, he whispered tenderly kissing her cheek. You do not seem to be very happy tonight, but tomorrow you will show a brighter face, eh? Nina had listened to her father with her face unmoved, with her half-closed eyes still gazing into the night, now made more intense by a heavy thundercloud that had crept down from the hills, blotting out the stars, merging sky, forest, and river into one mass of almost palpable blackness. The faint breeze had died out, but the distant rumble of thunder and pale flashes of lightning gave warning of the approaching storm. With a sigh, the girl turned towards the table. Almayer was in his hammock now, already half asleep. "'Take the lamp, Nina,' he muttered drowsily. "'This place is full of mosquitoes. Go to sleep, daughter.' But Nina put the lamp out and turned back again towards the balustrade of the veranda, standing with her arm round the wooden support and looking eagerly towards the pante reach, and motionless there in the oppressive calm of the tropical night, she could see at each flash of lightning the forest lining both banks up the river, bending before the furious blast of the coming tempest. The upper reach of the river whipped into white foam by the wind, and the black clouds torn into fantastic shapes, trailing low over the swaying trees. Round her all was as yet stillness and peace, but she could hear, afar off, the roar of the wind, the hiss of heavy rain, the wash of the waves on the tormented river. It came nearer and nearer, with loud thunderclaps and long flashes of vivid lightning, followed by short periods of appalling blackness. When the storm reached the low point dividing the river, the house shook in the wind, and the rain pattered loudly on the palm-leaf roof. The thunder spoke in one prolonged roll, and the incessant lightning disclosed a turmoil of leaping waters, driving logs, and the big trees bending before a brutal and merciless force. Undisturbed by the nightly event of the rainy monsoon, the father slept quietly, oblivious alike of his hopes, his misfortunes, his friends, and his enemies. And the daughter stood motionless at each flash of lightning, eagerly scanning the broad river with a steady and anxious gaze.